Okay, so part one, introduction to quinoa, origin, history, and brief description. So quinoa was, excuse me, I just, okay, so quinoa was um, domesticated near Lake Titicaca in Peru and Bolivia. You can see the arrow there about 7,000 years ago. From there, it spread north and south along primarily the Inca Trail, which is usually or in the in the heyday about 21 feet wide and, and stretched from Santiago to Quito. Um, but it stretched all the way up into Colombia and then down to about central Chile. And it arrived, you can see at the tip of the arrow there, about 2,700 years ago. So after the conquest of the Inca Empire, the cultivation of quinoa was discouraged um, primarily because of the religious affiliation with many of the indigenous people with quinoa. And, the, and so quinoa and other native crops were replaced primarily with uh, wheat and barley. So quinoa cultivation then was re reduced to really marginal environments um, and isolated areas, so very harsh um, areas of low input farming practices. And that's really shaped a lot of what, uh, what germplasm we have to work with now. And, and it actually has, um, has had some positive impact on our um, breeding strategies and then on worldwide adaptation as well. So there are five major groups of quinoa, and each of these, there, within each of these, there are um, dozens to hundreds of different varieties or farmer land races populations, if you will, um, breeding for. Well, I guess uh, so. Farmer selection going on for the full seven thousand plus years. However, more formalized academic type breeding has only been going on even in South America since about the nineteen seventies. So, so it's fairly recent. These are the five major types. There's sea level, um, south central Chile, with an altitude of less than 500 meters. And for most of what we're interested in, these are the, uh, the varieties that work for us here in the northern parts of the US. And then we also have um, Andean Valley, so a little bit higher elevation than sea level, but still not, not um, necessarily too high. But then it can go up to 4,000 meters. Um, we have subtropical, uh, Solaris, so very salt tolerant types come out of here, and then the Altiplano, so very high elevation, 35 to 4,000 meters in elevation. And so at WSU in um, August of 2013, so last August we put on, well, we hosted a international quinoa research symposium here. So we had about 150 people attend from 25 different countries. And the talks were all recorded. So throughout this presentation, I think I have four or five different um, links that I'll share with you on where you can find um, topics of specific interest. And so here, if you're if you're interested in in these groups and really key genetic diversity of quinoa worldwide, um, Didier Bazil from France has linked. Uh, seminar here and you can you can get to it from this link. Mo most of the topics I'm talking about today I won't be able to go into too too much depth so I'll, I'll add these links as we go. So quinoa is um, thought to be very broadly adapted. It's grown currently in, in um, uh, major regions over a very wide range of latitudes. So two degrees north to about 42 degrees south in South America so that's a range of over 3,000 miles and then quite a bit now you're seeing in Europe and Canada, uh, Denmark, the US, Pakistan, India, Australia, China, so all over the world. Uh, we grew our first crop in the Philippines last year. Um, it grows very wide range in altitude, so from sea level to 14,000 feet. The, the, uh, the idea that it only grows in high mountain areas is myth. It can grow very well at sea level as well. It uh, grows in a very wide range of annual precipitation, so about six inches to over 110 inches. Uh, we have all of those um, uh, rainfall zones represented here in Washington, so we're selecting in, in pretty much all, all of that. We don't go up to 110 quite, but close. 
So in general, quinoa is very drought tolerant. It also grows in a wide range of pH soils, and it's also frost tolerant. And and that the frost tolerance really depends on the the stage of the plant. It's more frost tolerant during the early vegetative stages, and once it starts to flower, it's, it becomes less frost tolerant, um, only to maybe 26 degrees Fahrenheit. But that uh, that's usually not an issue when it's flowering. So again, here another. Excellent webinar is by Senator Jake on what is the global patrol of quinoa with the link below. He was our keynote speaker for the symposium. So one of the reasons uh, quinoa has become so popular in the last 20 plus years is its nutritional value. So imports into the U.S. Um, and from about 4 million pounds per year, that was in 2007, and last year there were 73 million pounds imported into the U.S. Um, worldwide, there's about 105 hectares grown, um, Slovenia and Peru. Um, so back to the nutritional value, it's an excellent source of protein. The most common range is 12 to 18 percent, 16 percent is about average. Uh, we've seen anywhere from 7 to 2 percent reported in the literature. Um, but it's it's really the balance of the amino acids, the 10 essential amino acids within quinoa seeds that make it a complete protein and really make it a valuable source of protein for humans. Uh, it does have high concentrations of calcium, magnesium, iron, copper, and zinc. It's very rich in beta carotene and also rich in niacin, riboflavin, and several vitamins. It's high in essential fatty acids um, and in particular linoleic acid. It's due, uh, well, Actually, due to the high starch content, I'll maybe discuss a little bit, or if you have questions, we have a graduate student working on this now. It can be used very similarly to cereals and flour production. And so we're also testing different varieties for um, how they are used in processing. So we, we work with a food scientist who extrudes quinoa and different varieties to see how they work. And then one of the interesting parts is that of quinoa is it is gluten-free. Um, so for people with celiac disease, it's an excellent alternative to wheat. Um, and even, even many people with uh, just gluten allergies, this is a good option as well. So one of the most interesting and potentially useful aspects of quinoa is its salinity tolerance. And we do have some salinity issues in Washington. There's even more in the western U.S. Um, a few years ago I was doing a hop research trial and we had to we had to just pretty much forfeit give up the whole hop trial because the soil was too saline that was in the Yakima Valley and we're seeing higher and higher um, soil salinity within that valley in Washington State so quinoa is a potential good option for farmers to grow where um, saline soils exist uh, saline soils are defined anything for this premier or higher. Um, at, at that stage, most crops start to see a significant yield decrease. Um, quinoa, on the other hand, doesn't lose any yield up until about 20 decisiemens per meter, and then and then um, it starts to see some hit from yield. Uh, from 20 to 40 decisiemens per meter, quinoa can yield about 60% of normal, which is, is quite good. And it's even been shown to produce seed um, when grown in seawater, which is about 55 decisiemens per meter. This is a picture of wheat grown in a saline soil about 4 decisiemens per meter. And so you can see how, how damaged wheat is by the salinity. Just at four decisiemens per meter, uh, barley can go up to about six decisiemens per meter before it starts seeing some issues, and so quinoa again can go up to about 20, so uh, three to five times what wheat and barley can handle. Okay, so moving on to part two, quinoa botany and genetics.